Throwing Someplace Special by Patricia C. McKissick and Jerry Pinkney. Patricia Ann was about to burst with excitement. Crossing her fingers and closing her eyes, she blurted out her question. Mama Frances, may I go to someplace special by myself today? Pretty please, I know where to get off the bus and what streets to take it off. Although it had another name, Trisha Ann always called it someplace special because it was her favorite spot in the world. Please, may I go? Pretty please, with marshmallows on top? Uh, I don't know if I'm ready to turn you loose in the world. Mama Frances answered, tying the sash of Trisha Ann's dress. Going off alone is a mighty big step. I'm ready, the girl said, taking a giant leap across the floor. See what a big step I can make? Mama Frances chuckled, all the time steadying her granddaughter's face. I trust you'll be particular and remember everything I've told you. I will, I will, Trisha Ann said, real confidently. Suddenly her smile grew into a full grin. So you're saying I can go? Uh, I reckon, but you best hurry on before I change my mind. Pulling her pocketbook up on her shoulder, Trisha Ann blew her grandmother a thank you kiss. Then she rushed out the door and down the sidewalk. And no matter what, Mama Frances called after her, Hold your head up and act like you belong to somebody. At the corner, a green and white bus came to a jerky stop and hissed. When the doors folded back, Trisha Ann bounded up the steps and dropped in the fair, same as when Mama Frances was with her. The girl squared her shoulders, walked to the back, and took a seat behind the Jim Crow sign that said, Color Section. Trisha Ann had seen such signs all her life. She recalled the first time she and Mama Frances had taken this bus ride, and her grandmother had told her, The signs can tell us where to sit, but they can't tell us what to think. I'm going to think about someplace special, the Ann said to herself, and turned to look out the window. Stop by stop, the bus began to fill. At the farmer's market, People crowded on, carrying bags of fruit and vegetables. Miss Granel, Mama Frances' friend from sewing club, climbed on board. As she inched her way toward the back, Trisha Ann noticed that there were no seats left behind the Jim Crow sign. So she stood up and gave Miss Granel her seat. It's not fair, she said, glaring at the empty seats up front. No, but that's the way it is, honey, said Miss Granel. I don't understand why, she began. But by now the bus had reached Trisha Ann's stop in front of Capitol Square in the heart of downtown. The door swung open and she hurried off. Carry yourself proud, Miss Granel called out the window as the bus pulled away. Holding her hat, Trisha Ann leaned back as far as she could to see Peace Fountain's magnificent water show. It made her dizzy to watch the sprays that shot high into the air, but she liked the feeling and turned round and round with her arms outstretched. Then, giggling, she staggered on wobbly legs to a nearby bench. Instantly, Trisha Ann leaped to her feet. On the bench was a sign that said, For Whites Only. Her face fell, and she wished for Mama Frances' strong hand to hold. Silly signs, she muttered, as she strutted away on sober legs. At the edge of the square, she greeted Jimmy Lee, a street vendor. What's got your face all clouded up like a stormy day, he asked, handing Trisha Ann a free pretzel. Jim Crow makes me so mad, she said. 
My grandfather was a stonemason on Peace Fountain. Why can't I sit down and enjoy it? Jimmy Lee pointed to a sign under Monroe's restaurant window. He said, My brother cooks all the food they serve, but do you think we can sit at one of their tables and have a BLT and a cup of coffee together? Then with a chuckle he whispered, Not that I'd want to eat anything Jesse cooks. That man can't even scold Wally. The light changed and Trisha Ann carefully started across the street. Don't let those signs steal your happiness, Jimmy Lee called after her. Trisha Ann pulled her shoulders back and fixed her thoughts on being inside that warm and welcoming place where there were no signs. Hurrying up 10th Avenue, she passed the filling station and stopped to buy a pot to wash down Jimmy Lee's pretzel. At the second light, the Southland Hotel rose up in front of her, as spectacular as a palace. Mr. John Willis, the hotel's doorman, saw her. I believe an angel done slipped away from heaven, he said, smiling. Trisha Ann managed to smile back. Mr. John Willis always said the nicest things. No, sir, it's just me. Your mouth is smiling, but your eyes aren't, he said. Just then, a long white car with two police escorts pulled up in front of the hotel. A man with black shiny hair and shy eyes stepped out. Suddenly, people were everywhere screaming and begging for his autograph. Trisha Ann got caught in the crowd and swept inside. So often she'd wondered what it would feel like to walk on the royal red carpet that covered the double winding staircase, or to stand in the light of the chandelier that looked like a million diamonds strung together. Now there she was, smack in the middle of the Southland Hotel's grand lobby. Somebody pointed at her. What is she doing in here? It seemed as if the whole world had stopped talking, stopped moving, and was staring at her. The manager pushed his way to the front of the crowd. What makes you think you can come inside? No colored people are allowed. And he shooed the girl away with his arms. Trisha Ann backed out, shaking her head. I, I didn't mean, she said, trying hard not to. Hurrying past Mr. John Willis, Trisha Ann ran straight into the Mission Church ruins where Mama Frances often stopped to rest. There in the protection of the walled garden, the girl let the tears come. Getting to someplace special isn't worth it, she said. I'm going home. My flowers have been watered already, came a voice above her. It was Blooming Mary, an elderly woman who took care of the garden with neither permission nor pay. Everybody said she was addled, but Mama Frances didn't agree. Blooming Mary is a kind and gentle soul, she told Trisha Ann. You lost, child? the woman asked. Trying to steady her voice, Trisha Ann answered. No, ma'am. I just wish my grandmother was here to help me get to someplace special. You can't get there by yourself? It's too hard. I need my grandmother. Blooming Mary nodded and thought on the matter. Then she said, I believe your granny is here, just as my granny is here with me, even as I speak. Listen close. Tell me what you hear. All Trisha Ann heard was the distant buzz of a bumblebee. What was Blooming Mary talking about? But as she listened closer, she began to hear her grandmother's steady voice. You are somebody, a human being, no better, no worse than anybody else in this world. Getting someplace special is not an easy route. But don't study on quitting. Just keep walking straight ahead and you'll make it. Trisha Ann recalled these words from many conversations 
they'd had in this quiet place. They were so comforting, she didn't feel alone anymore. She wiped her eyes and straightened her hat. You are right, ma'am, the girl told Bloom and Mary. Mama Frances is here, and she wouldn't want me to turn back. So you aren't lost after all, said Bloom and Mary, giving Trisha Ann a bright orange Zanaya. No, ma'am, I'm not. And saying goodbye, she headed real determined like on her way. Two blocks later, Trisha Ann came to the Grand Music Palace, where a group had gathered for the matinee performance. As the girl approached, a little boy spoke to her. Howdy, I'm Hickey and I'm six years old today. You coming in? Before Trisha Ann could answer, an older girl grabbed his hand. Hush, boy, she said through clenched teeth. Colored people can't come in the front door. They got to go round back and sit up in the buzzard's roots. Don't you know nothing? His sister whispered harshly. Hickey looked at Trisha Ann with wide, wondering eyes. Are you going to sit up there? In the last three rows of the balcony? Why, I wouldn't sit up there even if watermelons bloomed in January. Besides, I'm going to someplace very, very special, she answered. And then Trisha Ann skipped away. I want to go where she's going, she heard Hickey say as his sister pulled him through the door. At the corner, Trisha Ann saw a building rising above all that surrounded it, looking proud in the summer sun. It was much more than bricks and stone. It was an idea. Mama Frances called it a doorway to freedom. When she looked at it, she didn't feel angry or hurt or embarrassed. At last, she whispered, I've made it to someplace special. Before bounding up the steps and through the front door, Trisha Ann stopped to look up at the message chiseled in the stone across the front facing. Public Library, all are welcome. The narration and production of this video was produced by Johnny Bell.